Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. We're excited to get into the Word here in a little bit. We're excited to to sing together, and uh, we're excited to follow our Lord's direction and command in remembering His broken body and shed blood for us with the Lord's Supper just at the conclusion of uh, our preaching time together. And so why don't we go ahead and stand now together and let's sing Alas and Did My Savior Bleed.
Amen. Focusing on the blood of Christ as we will focus on really a Christological passage of Scripture this morning as Jesus reveals himself even further to the Jews. And we will learn a vital lesson for us as well. But as he does, he's going to reveal, reveal himself today as the bread of life after performing such a spectacular miracle on the mountainside of Bethsaida. And so in part of our passage, he's going to say that those who come to him will never hunger and never thirst. And so I thought it apropos that a song that we had learned as our song of the month, Living Waters, which fits right in with Jesus is the water of life that we can drink freely, uh, with which after drinking we will never thirst. He is the bread of life, with that which after eating we will never hunger. Let's sing together, Living Waters. And you can be seated. I'll ask Nathaniel Partington at this time to come and open us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time we have to come here today to listen to your word being preached. We think of uh, later on as we celebrate your death and resurrection and look forward to your coming that uh, we would not take that in an unworthy manner pray that you would be with the hannahs as they um, had camp uh, last month um, as they made contacts with people in the community and different churches in the area pray that the uh, time there would have been profitable pray also for the wagners as they continue their bible translation in southeast asia pray that as myanmar has been disrupted and I pray that you would give them wisdom on when they need to move back and as Matt um, 
excuse me, as he's looking to make a trip there this month, they, uh, you just give him wisdom as they scout that out and uh, get the lay of the land and the, just give them wisdom. I'll pray also for Leanna Weeb as she is uh, getting married here. Pray that uh, you bless their marriage and that as they continue to minister there um, to the uh, Saskatchewan, uh, in, in Saskatchewan to the children. Pray that uh, that would be an effective ministry and that uh, they would see kids come to know you through uh, their ministry there in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue to focus on our Savior, let's sing All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Uh, Bill Van Ostrom at this time to come for a scripture reading. If you would go in your copy of God's Word to the book of Exodus in chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. We'll look at verses 10 through 23. The, I believe just the end of the chapter there. And uh, the words will be up there on the screen for you. Starting with verse 10. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, and as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, we were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten. 
but the fault is in your own. But he said, you are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily tasks each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them. And as they came out from Pharaoh, and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Well, on Wednesday evenings uh, at 7 p.m. for our Bible study, we're covering a few things. We're going over the, um, the different affirmations of, of doctrine that are laid out in the Apostles' Creed. And creeds and confessions, catechisms, they can be uh, very helpful in, in just kind of defining very simply the, do the doctrines that we believe. And so we've been walking through that. Uh, we've also been going through the book of Ephesians. And we've also been doing a, a short, probably will be about a three-week study on grumbling and complaining. And uh, we, what, we, what we looked at in our first lesson was the grumbling and complaining of the nation of Israel as they uh, were leaving the land of Egypt. And even after everything that God had done for them, they were still grumbling and complaining. I don't know anybody that would do that. But uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good reminder for us. So... Uh, if you're able, join us on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Then also remember coming up here in September, it'll be communicated our every other Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., a ladies' Bible study. So we'll look forward to those times together. All right, well, let's sing our song of the month as we have all faced our weekly trials, our daily trials, whether it's pain in the body or annoyance at work or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and yet we say, Lord, I will wait for you. Let's sing together. <clears throat> Lord, from the depths I call to you. Lord, hear me from on high and give attention. Oh, 
soul waits for the Lord. My hope is in His word. More than the watchman waits for dawn, my soul waits for the Lord. Amen. Well, just before we get into the preaching of the word, we're going to sing satisfied. Now, I'm saying this either last week or the week prior, but as we approach this text of scripture and we pr prepare our minds during the song service, would you consider these words in this song and meditate on them as we, as we come to God's word this morning, satisfied. satisfies your longings. If you are saved this morning, he, he has satisfied them, but oftentimes don't we continue to search for the allurements of the world? Would you please go with me in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of John and chapter 6. John chapter 6. Now, from time to time, I want to tell you what the most important thing is that we do at Gospel Fellowship. Those of you who have been around for a little while know what that is. It's what we're about to do. It's the preaching of God's Word. We, uh, we don't have a lot of furniture in this church. We rent this space. But we do have a pulpit, a kind of a, a big pulpit. And over the years, the, the pulpit 
has been front and center. There's a reason for that. The reason, there's a reason it's made of wood, it's big, it's kind of the looming piece of furniture in the room. Because we focus our attention on the preaching of God's word. And so as we come together, whether we know a passage well, or we find it difficult, or we've never heard a sermon on it before, we either learn something new about the character of God, or with our stubborn minds we are reminded again and again and again how we ought to live, how we ought to relate to our God. And so we ask each Lord's Day, by the way, I haven't gotten into the sermon yet. We, we, we ask each Lord's Day that as you come, that before you come, that you would look forward to this day, that you would look forward to it as much as you look forward to any vacation, any time with family, any rest and relaxation, a fun event, a fun activity. Not that church is meant to be fun, it's not, it's deadly serious. But it's a joyful time where we come together to hear God's word preached and proclaimed because that is what he has commanded his New Testament church. Church isn't fun, it's work. <laughs> it's work to get up in the morning and get ready and be here and sit there in what some of you might call uncomfortable chairs and pay attention to a sermon and use your diaphragm and muscles to sing songs of praise to our glorious God. And so we ask you this morning to work with us in the word. Let your mind be affixed on its truths so that it might penetrate our hearts and effect the change that God desires. Now on to the sermon. We begin this morning with the aftermath. The aftermath. The aftermath of a spectacular miracle where Jesus took five loaves of bread and two dried or pickled fish and multiplied them into thousands. The aftermath of a coronation gone bust after the would-be king made a beeline for the bush. The aftermath of a sleep-deprived crowd groping to find their only hope of restoring the earthly messianic kingdom and filling their hungry bellies to the gills. The aftermath of the disciples having been lost at sea and having witnessed Jesus walking on the churning waters of Galilee, only to come aboard the ship and teleport them immediately to land. And so today, in this passage, we begin with the aftermath of those events. The night has ended. Jesus has reached his next destination, Capernaum. The location that he's chosen in which to preach his next sermon. The location in which he will reveal himself to be. The satisfaction of man's craving. And so this morning, exactly two years into Jesus' earthly ministry, with just one year to go before his ultimate sacrifice, we'll see another large crowd gather, seeking the one whom they had identified as the prophet, like Moses in Deuteronomy 18, seeking the man whose very cloak could heal the most terminal of diseases. But these baffled bread hunters are going to get more than they bargained for. They're going to learn the most life-transforming lesson that the bread maker who they seek has a different sort of bread that isn't oven-baked. And we are going to learn a vital lesson that John, the son of Zebedee, the writer of this gospel, intends to impart to us because through Jesus' sermon, we'll find out that this crowd is after the wrong bread. And that, in fact, the whole world, the whole world from the first century on through this 21st century has been after the wrong bread. So would you be prepared for what Scripture is going to demand of you this morning? Would you be agreeable to it? It is this. Seek Jesus. 
He is the only bread that can satiate our spiritual starvation. The world's bread perishes immediately. Heaven's bread satisfies eternally. We're going to look at this passage of John 3 here in three parts over the next several weeks. If you're looking ahead, you see that there are many verses remaining in John chapter 6. And we won't cover them all this morning. So we'll break this up into three parts. And for part one today, perhaps it would be helpful for us to begin by asking ourselves a series of questions. Would you do that with me? Here are the questions that I want you to ask in your own mind as we begin to look at this text. Do I seek God only when I need something? Do I seek God only when he can make my life better? Do I seek God only for what he can do for me? Now, those are the accusing questions that ought to sit on the edge of our minds as we work our way through this passage. And may God give us the grace this morning to see that the bread that has rained down from heaven is the only bread that can save us from dying. The title of the sermon this morning is Believing in Better Bread. Part one, the modern Moses mystery manna. Would you look with me, please, at verse 22 of John chapter 6. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So, when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, we don't need to spend much time on these four verses here. Verses 22 through 25 are merely a bridge. And so we'll build it quickly together. It's a bridge from the miracle, the feeding of the 25,000, to the sermon that Jesus is about to preach. This is our interlude. This gets our first century audience from Bethsaida on the western shore of Galilee where Jesus performed the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 over to Capernaum on the eastern shore of Galilee about a six-mile boat trip from Bethsaida to Capernaum. And so this sets up our story. Now, remember where we were on the hillside of Bethsaida? 25,000 people evening, Jesus scurries off into the bush up the mountainside in Bethsaida. The disciples have gone away in the boat. And what do those 25,000 people do having left their homes? Well, I suppose they slept on the hillside. They slept on the hillside. And so here we are the next day, 25,000 people sleeping on the hillside, waking up the next morning, and they knew that the disciples' boat was gone, but they hadn't seen Jesus aboard, and that's why they stayed. Remember, they wanted to crown him king. Now, prior to the feeding of the 5,000 miracle, how had the crowd gotten there? Well, if you'll remember, Jesus and his disciples tried to escape the crowds just so they could at least have some kind of reprieve, perhaps a nap, or perhaps just eat lunch. And so they had gotten in a boat in Capernaum, and they had come all the way to Bethsaida, a six-mile boat ride. But what had the towns and villages done? They ran from Capernaum to Bethsaida and got there ahead of the boat on foot, running. Well, now here in verses 22 through 25 of John 6, we see that more boats arrive. Perhaps they had heard that Jesus was in Bethsaida, only they were too late. They came the next morning. 
Jesus was gone. And so as those boats arrived, and perhaps word had spread that Jesus and his disciples were now in Capernaum, that crowd of 25,000 people began to pile into boats in Bethsaida and go back to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, we know from Mark 6 that word had spread because Mark describes what happened as soon as Jesus reached the shore of Capernaum after teleporting the boat there. Listen, please, as I read Mark 6, 53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret, which is, by the way, another name for Galilee, and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. And so Jesus had now arrived in Capernaum. So that means the news had traveled back to Bethsaida of Jesus' whereabouts. Now, we can actually pinpoint where in Capernaum they were for this service. If you'll let your eyes fall on John 6, 59 in our passage this morning, we won't make it all the way to verse 59, but verse 59 lets us in on where Jesus was. John 6, 59 reads like this. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And so our sermon this morning takes place in Capernaum after a long night of a well-fed crowd of 25,000 people made it in boats from Bethsaida to Capernaum and found Jesus in the synagogue. You can only imagine the scene. I'm not sure how many that synagogue could hold. Likely not as many people as are even sitting here today. But that large crowd gathered outside the synagogue, hoping that they might receive bread, hoping that they might be healed, seeking Jesus. But what was the burning question on their mind? After Jesus had healed them, after Jesus had fed them, multiplying five loaves and two fish into thousands, The burning question on their minds in verse 25 was this. How in the world did you get here without being seen? (laughs) How did you get here? What did you? We thought you were in Bethsaida. You weren't in the boat. Now there's an important phrase in verse 24. I pronounced it as I read, but I want you to look at it. End of verse 24. Seeking Jesus. Seeking Jesus. Now hang on to that phrase, will you? Remember the questions that we asked at the outset of our sermon? Do I seek God only when I need something? Only when he can make my life better. Only for what he can do for me. And so this crowd was seeking Jesus. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? Like it's good to seek Jesus. It sounds good until we get to the motive, and so we're going to ask, for what reason were they seeking him? Why was the crowd seeking Jesus? And thankfully, Jesus is actually going to mind read the answer to that question, verse 26. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaf. Now, folks, verse 26 is super key. This is an incredibly important verse to unlock our passage this morning. Verse 26 gets to the heart of the matter right away. That's what Jesus always did. Remember remember our theme this morning. Seek Jesus. He is the only bread who can satiate our spiritual starvation. The world's bread perishes immediately. Heaven's bread satisfies eternally. Now, you might disagree with verse 26 when you read it at first. You might say, wait a second. 
Jesus said, you're not seeking me because you saw the signs. But isn't that the very reason they were seeking him? Because they saw the signs? They saw all of these healings. They saw the food multiplication. I mean, what would get you out of your home running 12 kilometers to Bethsaida and sitting on a hillside and sleeping there if not for the signs? They had even connected Jesus with the prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy 18. So why does Jesus say they weren't seeking him because they saw the signs? If it really seems like they were. Well, this gets back to our question. Do I seek God only when I need something? Only when he can make my life better? Only for what he can do for me? Oh, don't get Jesus wrong here. They saw the signs. In other words, they witnessed the signs. But what Jesus is saying is this. You're seeking me not because of me, but because of what you have realized you can get out of me. You're seeking me not because of me, but because of what you have realized you can get out of me. These people weren't seeking Jesus because of the purpose of the signs. What was the purpose of the signs? Meant to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That you might believe in him, and that by believing you might have life in his name. And so they weren't seeking Jesus because of the person of the signs. Catch this. Not because of the person of the signs, but because of the perks of the signs. They weren't there for worship. They were there for wealth. Folks, this was just the first century prosperity gospel. Here it is. Been going on a long time. But don't we do this? Don't we do this as well? We know what it's like to seek something, to desire something, simply because of what it will do for me. People do that with their voting, don't they? We vote for a politician because of what it will do for me. The Scottish judge and historian Alexander Fraser Teitler said this, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the majority discovers it can vote itself largesse out of the public treasury. <laughs> what will this politician do for me? Or how about the way we spend our money. How can I make my life happier? Isn't that the question we ask when we spend our money? What about big life decisions? Where to move? Who to marry? What to buy? What do we ask? Well, what brings me the most pleasure? What do I desire? And so whether it's voting or spending money or making big life decisions, those are the questions we often ask. Instead of asking... What is right? What does the Bible say? What are my motivations in choosing what I desire? Or how about this one, folks? How will my decisions affect my brothers and sisters in Christ? And so Jesus is saying in verse 26, you're after the perks, not the person blinded to the purpose of the signs. And so first he gives them this rebuke here in verse 26, but then he follows it up with some instructions. Verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. All right. Now are you seeing why Jesus did that miracle of the feeding of the 25,000? Do you see why he did that? It was just one big massive object lesson. Now object lessons are very memorable, aren't they? Oftentimes when teachers are teaching children, they'll use objects to help teach them because it sticks in their brains. Now, what would stick in your brain better during a sermon like this one 
than Jesus multiplying five loaves of bread into thousands. And so that was the springboard for his sermon this morning. So food, food is going to be the metaphor for salvation. That's what it is here in verse 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And so all of a sudden we have our metaphor, food. And we're going to find out in a minute that that food is actually specifically bread, just like the miracle. Now I'm going to ask you to please go in your copy of God's Word, holding your place in John 6 to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Because I want you to see that Jesus is actually drawing this Jewish crowd in the synagogue, perhaps even on the Sabbath, to Isaiah 55. I don't know that they've figured that out. But let's see what Isaiah has to say and see if we can match it up with what Jesus has just declared. Isaiah 55, would you look with me at verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your, listen, soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Okay, with that backdrop of Isaiah 55, we're back in verse 27 of John 6. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And Isaiah 55 was exactly where Jesus was drawing this crowd's mind. Well, let's ask a couple of questions here about verse 27. First question is this, what is the food that perishes? What is the food that perishes? Well, simply put, you could say earthly bread. That's what the people were after, the perks. Their bellies had been filled and they wanted more of it. But Jesus says the same thing as Isaiah. Why are you working and spending money on bread that really isn't bread? The world's bread perishes immediately. Heaven's bread satisfies eternally. Now, in order for us to understand that the world's bread perishes immediately we'll use a bit of an object lesson in our mind's eye. I'll ask this question. How many of you keep your bread in the refrigerator? Okay. How many of you keep your bread just on the counter? Or in a cupboard? Okay. All right. And some of you might have it in the freezer. Okay. Yep. Okay. There we go. Found the rest of the hands. Now, Have you ever pulled your bread out of the refrigerator thinking, I've preserved my bread in the cold, and and you get ready to make a sandwich, and perhaps you put some mayonnaise or butter or Miracle Whip on this bread, and as you're spreading, you pick up the next piece, and all of a sudden realize it's green. And it's not like you had some healthy bread that had pumpkin seeds in it and was supposed to be green. It was just plain old white bread And now it's green, green mold on the bread. Now, those of us who keep our bread in the refrigerator are quite disturbed when that happens because we thought refrigerating the bread was going to keep it from perishing. And yet it doesn't. Not always, anyway. Folks, the world's bread perishes immediately. Heaven's bread satisfies eternally. Now in verse 27, I want to draw your attention to an apparent problem. Some of you may have noticed it, some of you not. It's the idea of work. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And so the apparent problem is this, are we supposed to work for eternal life? Or is Jesus teaching that we are supposed to work for eternal life? No. Jesus is not teaching 
a salvation by works. He's simply pointing out what the crowd is after. What are they pursuing? What are they expending their energies on? Eternal things or earthly things? Same thing that Isaiah said. Isaiah said, come and buy this. Well, he wasn't teaching that you buy your salvation, but rather that they are coming to him. In fact, if you look at the end of verse 27 there, we notice that the food that endures to eternal life, it can't be worked for anyway. It is a gift. Look at what it said. Jesus gives it to us. And so what's the point? Well, have you ever hit a pinata? Or have you ever watched a large group of children who love candy hitting a pinata? Well, the hitting of the pinata is kind of boring, at least for everyone except the one person who's hitting the pinata. And each child in turn puts a blindfold on and tries to take a swipe or several at the pinata while the parents crowd around and try to keep the kids far away from the long stick. And at some point, the pinata breaks wide open. And what falls to the ground, if the parents have done their job correctly, is a whole lot of candy. And as that candy falls to the ground, and perhaps a parent takes the remaining candy in the pinata and shakes it onto the grass, what do the kids do? They expend their energies in excitement, filling up their shirts that they've turned into a cloth basket full of as much candy as they can get. This is the point of verse 27. Do not expend your energies for the world's bread that perishes immediately. Expend your energies. Be excited about the bread that endures forever. Now here in verse 27, we also see that that the Father has sealed Jesus Christ. Now, the king's seal, usually his signet ring, it meant that if he were sending a message in an envelope and the king's seal was on that envelope, that the message was from the king. And therefore, the message had the king's full authority and approval. Another word we might use for this is certified, that Jesus was certified. I was in a Panago Pizza a couple of days ago, and there were two signs hanging in the restaurant. One was from Fraser Health, certifying that that restaurant met the food safety standards. What else do you do when you're waiting for pizza except read signs on the wall? The other sign showed that the restaurant had obtained its appropriate business license with a maximum occupancy allowed in the building. That restaurant was certified, certified. Within our local body here, we have a, a certified power engineer. In order to become certified, one must take courses, pass exams, become certified to do a specific work. Verse 27 teaches that Jesus is certified by the Father. He was sealed at his baptism. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Pleased also Jesus argued in our last chapter, John 5, that the Father was a witness to Jesus' authority and had vested him with authority over life and death and all judgment. And now, Jesus hasn't come out and said exactly what the food is yet. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. But now he's alluded to it. What do we know the food is? We know that the mystery manna is Jesus. The mystery manna is Jesus. It's him. But the crowd hasn't figured that out yet. We know that by verse 28. Look with me. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? The crowd thinks they can earn this eternal food. The crowd misunderstands the thrust of Jesus' prohibition. 
This is D.A. Carson. He says, the crowd misunderstands the thrust of Jesus' prohibition. His words, do not work for the food that spoils, did not focus on the nature of work, but on what is or is not an appropriate goal. His point was not that they should attempt some novel form of work, but that merely material notions of blessing are not worth pursuing. And folks, they missed Jesus' words in verse 27, where this eternal food of which Jesus spoke would be given to them, not worked for. They think they need to work to get the eternal life, but they missed the Isaiah 55 illusion. Verse 29. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. All right, well, it all boils down to one action. This is what Jesus is teaching. Now, I'm going to call it an action here. Believe in the person, not in the perks. Now, we finally find out here in verse 29 that the food is a person. The food is a person. Believe in the one whom he has sent. Now, some of you might have questions about this idea that the work of God is to believe. The work of God is to believe. We already dealt with the question, is Jesus teaching us to work for our salvation? Jesus says the work of God is that you believe in him who he has sent. Morris says that the work of God means that which God requires of us. This is not a work as in something that we do to merit our eternal life. In fact, I've never heard of a, a Christian saying, I believed. <laughs> I did it. I believed. None of us look to belief as a work that we have done in order to merit our salvation. It is merely commanded. It is a command that we obey. 1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. But isn't this what we preach and proclaim? The same thing that Jesus is doing here. The response required of all men is that they would believe. It is a command to all people. Now, Jesus is about to get himself in trouble. He's now alluded to the fact that the bread or the food is a person on whom the Father has set his seal. Now he's revealed that the food is a person that has been sent by God. Now, we know Jesus was sent by God. Jesus told that to Nicodemus in John 3, 17, when he said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But it is also here that we notice the purpose of this gospel. Verse 29 says, believe. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Well, the people are, are kind of sort of catching on here as they're standing inside and outside of the synagogue. They realize that Jesus is talking about himself. All of a sudden they get it. The food, the work, is belief in a person. But they're not so ready to believe in him. They understand, to one degree or another, what he's saying, but there's something that Jesus has to do first. Verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so what do the Jews ask for? Well, okay, now we get it. The food is belief in the one who's sent down from heaven, and we're pretty sure that you're implying that's you. <laughs> okay, well, what are you going to do to prove it? Uh, we have an idea. Remember Moses, our father? Well, for 40 years, Moses made manna rain down from heaven while the Jews were wandering in the wilderness. What are you going to do? Isn't that just like the Jews? In Matthew 12, 38, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Even Paul wrote about that in 1 Corinthians 1, For Jews demand signs. 
Now, you might be asking yourself the same question that I did when I read verses 30 and 31. Wait a second. They want to see manna rain down from heaven? Didn't they just get fed by five loaves on a hillside that multiplied into enough food for 25,000 people? But what had happened on that hillside to Jesus' disciples? We briefly touched on it. Mark said that the disciples' eyes had been blinded and that it was not until Jesus entered the boat that they realized who he was and worshipped him. Could it be that the entire crowd's eyes were blinded to what Jesus had done? Or perhaps they were asking for an even greater sign. Like, yeah, we saw the feeding. I mean, we, 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 we saw that little one act there where you, you changed the bread and the fish into many and you fed us all. We, we've seen you heal us. But Moses, he gave us bread for 40 years. What are you going to do that's comparable to this so that we can see you and believe in you? Now, do you catch what's going on? Is this really because they want to worship Jesus? Or is it because of what they can get out of it? Now, Jesus is more than willing to discuss bread. Verse 32, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, Jesus is going to sort of ignore their request for a sign here. Remember, they said, well, what sign are you going to do so that we can see you and believe in you? And he's actually going to completely ignore that. Instead, he's going to correct their understanding of the scriptures. And so this is Sunday school in the synagogue. Jesus says, oh, folks, it wasn't Moses who gave you the manna. It was God. And it is also God who is giving you a different kind of bread. The true bread. The true bread. You see that there in verse 32. Now, Jesus uses that, those same phrases elsewhere in the Gospel of John. Do you remember in John 1, 9 when Jesus is called the true light? The true light. Remember when Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well in John 4? And he discusses the true worshipers. The true worshipers. And so we have the true bread, the true light the true worshipers. And how are we to understand the true bread? Well, you might say it like this. It's the only bread that matters. It's the only bread that matters. Or you could simply say, it's the only true bread. Jesus is the only true light. Those who worship the Father in truth and spirit, are the only true worshipers. Like, this is the real deal, the one and only, the true bread. Jesus had just said not to work for the bread that perishes in verse 27. Now, what happened to the manna that Moses gave? It molded. It rotted. Just like the bread in our refrigerators, on our counters, Manna perished. But how was the true bread different? What was it that made the mystery manna the true bread? Well, what was it? Verse 33. This bread gives life to the world. This bread gives life to the world. And now for the third time, for the third time, if you've been following, we see that this bread is a person The first time we saw in verse 27, he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the first bread that in the first so the first of all, the bread that endures to eternal life that the son of man gives. That was verse 27. Second, verse 29, believe in him whom God has sent. And then third, verse 33, the bread is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so three times this bread is a person. And the God who gave the manna 
also gives you the prophet like Moses. This is the modern Moses. They had recognized that. And God gives you the modern Moses mystery man. See, he's wetting their appetite here. He hasn't quite revealed what the bread is. Or rather, we might say he hasn't revealed who it is, who is the mystery manna. But after this explanation, the crowd is craving it. Verse 34, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. The mystery bread. Now, do you remember anyone else that had the same response that they did here? Give us this bread always. Do you remember the woman at the well in John 4? We sang living waters this morning. Jesus had said, well, if you come to the well, that I'll show you. Go call your husband. Come to the well that, that I'll show you. If you drink from that well, you'll never be thirsty again. And what did the woman at the well say? She said, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Same thing that the crowd says here. Jesus teaches the crowd in the synagogue at Capernaum that this bread comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they respond, give us this bread. But folks, again, they're after the perks, not the person. Now they're after the heavenly manna that will be the everlasting gobstopper of hunger pangs for them. They'll never be hungry again. How wonderful. But now the curtains are about to open. The modern Moses mystery manna is about to be revealed. And he's standing right there in the synagogue in Capernaum. Sir, give us this bread always. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This expression, I am the bread of life, is the first of seven expressions in the Gospel of John where Jesus begins with the Greek words, ego, a me, or I am. These expressions are a nod to the deity of Jesus Christ that the writer of the Gospel of John has set out to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I am is the covenant name of God. Yahweh, I am. We have been reading through the book of Exodus and we have seen at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 that God revealed to Moses that he is the I am. And here in John 6 is the first such expression, I am the bread of life. There are six others that Jesus is going to proclaim as we walk through this gospel. He is going to say, I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Friends, who else could be all of those things? A God? A created God? No one else could be all of those things except the God of the universe. Jesus is God. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the bread of life? I am the bread of life. How do we understand the metaphor? This is what he means. He is the bread that gives life. It is through this bread, Jesus, or you might say through belief in this bread, in the person of Jesus, that life is produced in a person. Again, it's an allusion back to Isaiah 55. Isaiah said the same thing, come to me. Jesus says that whoever comes to me shall not hunger there in verse 35. And earlier, as we mentioned in verse 27, Jesus said that it is the son of man who gives eternal life. And here we have the very simple voluntary action and response to this truth. Believe. Believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, the bread, the true bread, the only bread, the one and only bread, then Jesus will generate life in you, the eternal kind. Folks, Jesus' declaration here, it corrected the people's misunderstanding of the nature of the bread. They're still thinking about physically physical bread, or, or at least bread that can meet their physical needs. 
But the bread was not physical material food. It was faith in a person. But don't do what this crowd's about to do. We'll see it next time. They look at this bread as a smorgasbord, a buffet. Ah, it's a take it or leave it. Maybe I'm not hungry anymore. But the nature of this food is different. Don't look at it as if you can just skip a meal and pick up the next one. If you were in the desert, lost, without food, you may be able to last several weeks if you had water, perhaps. But soon you'll need some kind of physical food or you will die. And the vital lesson that we need to learn this morning from this passage is that each person who has ever lived is a sinner wasting away in the desert of sin, condemned by and separated from God. Each person, therefore, is desperately hungry for something that can sustain them. The problem, there is no such physical food that can do it, that can satisfy this hunger. In fact, there's only one food that can satisfy this hunger, and without it, you are surely going to die. And I don't mean physically. I mean spiritually, forever. You are going to end up dying of starvation. You will go straight to an eternity in hell separated from God forever, cut off from his grace and his provision and his people. And you need but one food, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, Jesus is the food that satisfies eternally, that nourishes forever, that when consumed imparts not a full belly, but life everlasting. And so I ask, what are you waiting for? Take the bread, grab it while you can. The greatest mistake you can make in life is to die without Jesus. And so as Isaiah says, come to him, come to Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And so if you happen to be part of this baffled band of bread hunters, won't you come to Jesus today? Believe in him, trust him as your savior, as your Lord, and your hunger will end forever. But what about you, Christian brothers and sisters? You've found the bread. You've believed in the person. Your hunger's been satisfied. Do you remember our questions? Do I seek God only when I need something? Only when he can make my life better. Only for what he can do for me. The vital lesson that we must learn is the same as it was for those Jews. Seek the person, not the perks. Don't chase the perks. Chase the person. Seek Jesus. He is the only bread that can satiate our spiritual starvation, who can satisfy our terminal craving. The world's bread perishes immediately. Heaven's bread satisfies eternally. And so I leave you with this. In the week ahead, let's bring it right down to an earthly level, shall we? In the week ahead, Determine how you will seek Jesus apart from what he can do for you. If you've come this morning to consume the word and you've purposed to go out and do what Jesus has commanded, then determine how you'll seek Jesus apart from what he can do for you. And so how will we worship him this week apart from what he can do for us? How will we learn from him this week? How are we going to thank him when? For what? How will we adore him? How will we proclaim him? Would we ask these questions as we go into our week and would we figure it out? 
God has rained down the only bread that can keep us from dying. Are we still chasing that which is oven baked? Or do we really believe in a better bread? Let's pray. Our Father, you have rained down the mystery manna, the mystery revealed. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. Jesus is the bread of life, the bread that imparts life, that generates life, that gives us life. And for any listening who are after the world's bread, would they in humility say, I believe in the true bread from heaven, Jesus Christ, as their Lord. Father, sometimes as Christians, we, we know we've done that. It's settled. And our cravings kind of change. We start craving the world's bread again. We ask, what can make us happy? And instead of adoring you and thanking you, instead of proclaiming you and learning of you and rejoicing in you, oh, we only come to you when we need you. When we want exactly what this crowd wanted, what can Jesus do for me? And so would you allow the vital lesson that we've learned this morning to change how we relate to you that we might be thankful people, realizing that if we're craving the bread in the refrigerator, it's going to perish immediately. And so let us always believe in the better bread, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Well, in just a, a few moments after this closing song, we're going to move right into the Lord's Supper. And we are going to remember Christ's death. Um, we may do this again next Lord's Day as well. This passage certainly is very apropos to what we're going to consider here in a moment. And as we approach this time... Some may think it a dirge, uh, depressing. Uh, I felt that way before. And you know what? I think we're supposed to feel that way. I think we're supposed to feel that way in some senses. Not that we walk away from it depressed. In, in, in many ways, we walk away from it rejoicing, but it's not supposed to be a, a happy-go-lucky time. We're about to focus on the death of Christ Jesus is the bread of life, but he, he's also the broken bread for us. And as we come to this time of consideration, I will say, I don't think it's ever a happy thing to dwell on death. But that is what we're going to do as Christ has commanded us to do it. And so this song, Behold the Lamb, will not only conclude uh, our preaching time, but will also lead us in to the time of proclaiming Christ's death until he comes. Uh, and so we'll ask you to stand in just a moment as we sing this song, and then we'll have you just be seated right away as we move right into our communion time. Would you stand with us now? Behold the Lamb.
a couple of instructions. Uh, in a moment, uh, after we say a few words here on the Lord's table, we are going to pass the plate and we'll just ask that we'll have uh, someone on either side and in the center and we'll just ask that you pass it all the way down your row. Also, uh, you will just get one cup and within that cup you'll peel back a first layer and there will be a, a wafer there, and then you'll peel back a second layer, and, and that'll be where the juice is in case you're trying to figure out how to, to open uh, that there, okay? Uh, so I want to give those instructions to you. Well, would you uh, either go with me or listen as I read whatever you wish to Luke chapter 22. I'm going to read verses 14 through 23 as we prepare for this time together. Luke chapter 22, verse 14 reads like this. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Now, before we approach the Lord's Supper, it, it's a solemn time, and Scripture has a few things to say about it, and so we want to make sure that we not only approach it solemnly, but we also know what Scripture has to say. And so rather than just rush into passing it out, we want to discern what we're about to do. And so you might ask, why do we take the Lord's Supper? Why do we do this, this event? Well, the first thing that I would note is it is not salvific. There's nothing in or around these elements. They don't become anything else. Salvation is by faith alone in Christ, as we learned this morning. Not in works, doing this 
doesn't save you. Doing this doesn't minister grace to you. Some would teach that there are, though they wouldn't use these words, some sort of magic in the elements. The elements do not become the body and blood of Jesus as you consume them. Jesus is not inside these elements. These elements are not in and of themselves effectual. We don't partake this morning because we're going to somehow look more righteous in the sight of God by partaking of these. You're not going to earn extra favor from God by partaking. I don't mean to diminish the seriousness of what we're about to do, but what you have in that cup is a cracker and some juice. That's what's there. Nothing more. And so then why do we do it? Because Christ said, do this. <laughs> That's all we need. That is all we need. Now I'm about to give you some more reasons than that because scripture gives them to us. But Christ says, do this. And we do it to remember his death. Jesus' death satiated the just wrath of God against us. Jesus' death is the means by which you and I have peace with a three times holy God. Jesus became your sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus says, it's important that you remember that. Remember. But there's a second purpose for the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six says this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so if the first reason we do this is because God commanded it, and if the second reason we do this is to remember what Christ's death did for us, the third reason we do it is to proclaim Christ's death. You proclaim his death until he comes. So how do we do that? Well, we're doing this together. And so we are together proclaiming to one another Christ's death until he comes. And so nothing magical. You're not going to leave here a different person this morning for any other reason than that you've been reminded that Jesus died for you and because you've joyfully proclaimed it here together with your brothers and sisters. And so let this time stir us up with thankfulness, but let it also engender in us a resolve to love. Let it foster in us a mind to set our minds on things of righteousness, and let it make us joyful in Christ as we enjoy proclaiming him together this morning. You might ask the question, who can partake of the Lord's Supper, or better yet, for whom is the Lord's Supper? Well, the Lord's Supper is for his disciples, for his disciples. Though baptism is not specifically mentioned as a prerequisite for the Lord's Supper, it would be assumed in obedience. And so we would say it like this, the Lord's Supper is for obedient Christians, obedient Christians. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 29 says this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. And so if that's the case, then we take this moment right here just to stop before we pass out what is a cracker and what is juice. Jesus says, examine yourself. Because if we do this flippantly, if we do this without discerning, without considering, without thinking about what we're doing, then we're actually eating and drinking judgment on ourselves. And so what are we supposed to do when we examine ourselves? Well, Simply consider the cross. Consider the cross and consider that what you're doing is remembering the cross of Christ. I think it's also important that we come before God in this moment. That you and I individually come before God and ask, are we walking the talk? 
Are we living as obedient Christians? Do we have any unconfessed sin before God in our lives? We're about to come to Him in a very solemn moment and remember and proclaim His death for our sins. So discern the moment. Are we going through the motions or are we thankful to God for His death for us? So as we pass these elements, would you take a moment and just examine yourself before God, confessing to Him any outstanding matters of sin. And we'll remember Him together. I'm going to ask uh, Brother John Fisher to come now and pray. Um, You can come up here, brother, and and pray for us uh, as we consider Christ's breaking his body for us. Let's just join in prayer. Father, we just want to take this time, and uh, uh, as Brother David's already said, we were broken by our own sin, but we also rejoice. Uh, This uh, small piece of bread or wafer is not particularly refreshing to the body but it's refreshing to the soul to know that every sin we've ever committed will commit you broke your body to forgive it that we have life together forever and this symbol reminds us of that that we are one in Christ we are hid in Christ we feed with a spiritual food. So Lord, uh, help us to at the same time rejoice and be renewed uh, by just partaking of this. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. been able to open your top portion there you can go ahead and and do that now first Corinthians 11 23 says for I received from the Lord but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray now for to thank Christ for his shed blood for us. Oh, Father, it pleased you to crush your son on our behalf. He shed his blood for us in more ways than one. He was the perfect lamb, the true lamb, the spotless lamb, in whom was no guile or sin or any impurity, Tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. The, one, the only one who was undeserving of being a sacrifice, and yet he became a sacrifice for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so it is in this moment that we remember that Jesus shed his blood for us so that we could escape the eternal wrath of God we are atoned for under the blood of Christ. And we thank you for that atonement as we remember it now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. First Corinthians 11.25 says this, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Well, as we've considered the word today, both in solemnity and in joy, may we go from this place with the power of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit works salvation in us so that we might do the works of God and as we purpose to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We read that we proclaim the death of Christ until what? event until he comes back for us he is coming back for us we are going to go home and i don't mean that you're going to go get in your vehicles and drive to your earthly homes but we are going home to our father we're going home to our king jesus and so we're going to sing a song now as we have proclaimed the death of christ until he comes called almost home would you stand with us Sing. 